Hello and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. I'm Gareth Vaughan from interest.co.nz. The Commerce Commission's recent announcement of a market study into competition for personal banking services will include a probe into how banks make their interest rate decisions for both home loans and deposits. This seems a good catalyst for a broader conversation on how interest rates, which in one form or another have been with us for thousands of years, are set. To do this, I'm joined by David Cunningham. David is the CEO of financial services firm Squirrel Group and a former CEO of the Cooperative Bank and a manager at Westpac New Zealand. Hi, David, and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. Great to join you today. Yeah, look, thanks for being here. Look, I'm keen to talk about um, interest rates across a range of different types of, of, of loans and savings products or investment products. Mm. But perhaps we should start off with the good old official cash rate because that's sometimes described as New Zealand's benchmark interest rate. Mm. So I think most people understand that it is set by the Reserve Bank, but how does the Reserve Bank actually set it and how influential is it? Well, it's the anchor for all interest rates, Gareth. So the Reserve Bank sets it through the Monetary Policy Committee, which meets roughly every six weeks or so Mm. through the year. I think they meet about eight times a year. And when they set it, there's really one ultimate purpose. There are lots of different things that over time have fed into the things the Reserve Bank has to consider, but ultimately it is one thing, which is controlling inflation. And so when they lift it, they're trying to slow things in the economy down to take out inflationary pressures. And when they ease it or lower it, they're trying to remove that tight condition or um, stimulate more economic activity so as inflation stays within that um, the bounds of the 1% to 3%, that's their mandate. So it's all about using monetary policy, lifting and lowering the interest rate to drive economic activity up or down, which influences things like unemployment and spending habits and um, house prices even. Um, to, and to rates, Yeah, e- ex- exactly. Yeah. And so it's the anchor for all those uh, interest rates that bank set generally, though there are some rates that don't necessarily move when the OCR moves, which we can talk about later. Yeah, no, obviously. Look, I thought it'd be good to have a bit of a look at wholesale interest rates too, because mm. Obviously, these play into what banks do and other lenders do with their own rates. So I guess there are a couple that spring to mind to me immediately, swap rates Mm -hmm. and the old uh, bank bill benchmark rate Mm -hmm. or BKBM. So if Mm -hmm. we look at swap rates first, what are these and how are they set? Yeah, actually, it's possibly better to start with bank bill rates because, you know, if you sort of work up the curve, the Reserve Bank sets the official cash rate. Everything else is determined by market participants buying and selling and, you know, the midpoint of that buying and selling is what the interest rate will be. And so the OCI has a huge influence on the bank bill rate. So the bank bill rate's the the rate at which banks will lend between each other, borrow lend between each other for a term of, say, 30, 60, 90 days, six months and so on. So that will naturally be really anchored to the official cash rate. So if the official cash rate goes up 50 basis points, you can beat your bottom dollar, those three-month bank bill rates will go up by about 50 basis points. But the thing to remember is that those bank bill rates aren't for one day, they're for 30 days or 90 days. And so they'll reflect what the OCR is expected to be at a point in the future. So the 90-day bank bill rate is the market's expectation of what the official cash rate will be over those 90 days. So you'll see leading into an OCR announcement, if there's an expectation interest rates are going up 50 points, the bank bill rate will be 50 points above the cash rate, give or take a bit um, broadly. And so wholesale rates are simply an expectation of the future level of, um, of, of the OCR. There's a point, though, when you get up to very long-term interest rates, like, say, 10 years, government stock rates and swap rates, wholesale rates that drive off that, they'll start to be more influenced by what's happening globally. So, for example, US interest rates will have an influence on those very long-term rates. So you'd sort of say global interest rates have probably, I don't know, 50%, 75% impact on those very long rates. Um, The OCR in New Zealand on the short-term rates, and depending on where you are between sort of zero and 10 years, will have different influences. But for New Zealanders, really, it's mainly um, the OCR because most of our borrowing and investing is done for terms of, you know, less than three years. You know, most home lending is the typical term is one year or two year. You can do a five-year loan. Um, but uh, And then term deposit rates, almost every term deposit in New Zealand is for a term of one year or less. So ultimately, 
long and short, short of it is, is it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the OCR that anchors things and it's particularly the expectation of what that level will be determined by market participants buying and selling and finding that midpoint like yep. you have with anything. An open market determines the, the, the interest rate. So they're the anchor. All those interest rates are the anchor for where retail interest rates will be. Okay. And then swap rates? So swap rates are the, 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 the price at which banks will do a deal for a longer term. So I won't get into the complexities <laughs> of how a swap will work, but effectively the thing called the swap curve, you, you, you're swapping interest payments between banks and so on. So it's a, 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 an instrument that's been in place for a long time, and that really becomes the benchmark for where you set, say, mortgage rates. So let's say the OCR is, is 5.5% today. The one-year swap rate is about 5.75% today. And that 5.75 becomes the benchmark for where banks will set, say, home lending rates for one year. If it's a two-year fixed rate, it will be the two-year swap rate. If it's five-year, it will be the five-year swap rate. So it's sort of the benchmark upon which the bank will add a margin because they want everything back floating rate because they don't want to take interest rate risk. They want to make the same margin whether rates are high or low they're targeting the overall bank interest margin, but it becomes the benchmark for setting those fixed rates and then converting them back to everything being floating so they don't have risk on their balance sheets. Okay. So, you know, obviously you've looked at the Commerce Commission's um, investigation into into competition for, for personal banking services, as I have. And one of the things that I thought was interesting in their paper was they said, we are interested in the dynamic between the interest rates charged for lending and interest rates paid for deposits. And they said they will seek to understand how banks make their interest rate decisions in respect of home loans and deposits. Mm. So, I mean, I guess in my mind I thought, well, if nothing else, this is could be a useful public service because a lot of people don't understand how this dynamic works. Mm. So, and, and sometimes I wonder if banks want us to. Um, as well. <laughs> so look, starting with home loans, how do you, I mean, you've talked about it a bit with swap rates already, mm. but how do they make their interest rate decisions and what are the key factors in, involved? Yeah, well, these days all banks have something called a pricing committee and they normally meet each week, uh, normally on a Tuesday or Wednesday. So you'll often see interest rates change on a Thursday or Friday following that pricing committee meeting. Um, and at those pricing committee meetings, the product management people, the treasury people, the sales sort of teams get together. There'll normally be an economist there sort of helping guide what's happening with interest rates. And what they're looking at is the interest margins on all the different products. The thing to remember is, though, it's not really those margins on different products change over time. Banks ultimately manage to the overall interest margin in other words, what the difference is between the whole portfolio of the loans they make and the whole portfolio of deposits that they have. So if you think about what we as um, consumers have, we've got a transaction account, we've got a savings account, we might have some TDs. Um, as a bank, you know, they're providing those services. They'll have some wholesale borrowings. They'll have borrowings from business customers and so on. So there's this whole blend of all these different things that they're funding and then they're lending on different products as well, home loans, personal loans, credit cards, business loans, even corporate loans and so on. Um, so it's the difference between what they borrow at and what they lend at that is ultimately what banks are managing. And through the interest rate cycle, as interest rates rise and fall, those margins on different products will go up and down. So a great example is transaction accounts. You probably earn 0% on your transaction account. Funnily enough, New Zealanders have got $40 billion sitting in those accounts at 0%. Two years ago, it was 0% that you're earning as a customer. Today, it's 0% you're earning as a customer. But interest rates have gone up from 0.25 to 5.5%. And so the banks have earned a lot more margin on those, over $2 billion more margin. But at the same time, the margin on home loans is contract contracted. So back then, you could get a home loan for 2.5%. Now it's sort of 7 7.5%. So it hasn't necessarily risen as much as it would have. Um, if you didn't have that buffer coming from the other side. So it's really the margin between the two. Now, the wholesale rate that we've talked about becomes the reference point. So banks use something called transfer pricing where they use the wholesale rate as a benchmark and then they assess the margin above that for loans and below that for, for deposits. But of course, those margins on loans and deposits move in and out through the interest rate cycle. They're wider on lending at the lows and narrower on lending at the highs. And so it's that overall margin. I think what the Commerce Commission should be looking at is that overall margin um, because there's sort of a give and take. 
um, uh, there. And that's the beauty of banking in some ways that I guess there's a bit less pain than there should be for savers at the bottom of the cycle and a bit less pain for borrowers at the top of the sort of cycle. So, you know, you use the wholesale rate as a benchmark to compare, but accept that those margins will go in and out over time because banks have both sides of the balance sheet. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the deposits side of it, what are the key factors there? Is there a key benchmark that, that those rates are matched to? Well, I mean, the OCR is sort of the influence, yeah. but some things move and some don't. So the transaction mm. account interest rates stayed at zero, even though the official cash rate yeah. is five and a quarter percent higher. Savings accounts bottomed at about 0.1 percent, just 0.1 percent. It's hard to relate to I can to remember now. that. Yeah, 0.1 yeah, yeah. percent you got on your <clears throat> savings account. Um, today, the average savings account interest rates is a bit over 3 percent, 3 to 3.5 percent. And so... So, you know, those are making a 2% margin to the official cash rate today on the $75 billion in savings accounts. Go back two years, it was nothing, almost nothing. And so, you know, really, really illustrates how those sort of margins go in and out. So at a bank, you'll be recording that you made 0% profit on those savings accounts two years ago and that you're making, you know, a couple of billion dollars of profit on them now. And that's this whole sort of there's a bit on one side offset against a bit on the other side. But in reporting at a bank level, um, you know, the accountants will produce a report that shows the margin between wholesale and the retail rates and, you know, on both loans and deposits. Okay. But we've got to accept that those margins change a lot during the interest rate cycle. You just can't look at home loans and say the margin is always, let's say, one and a half percent. At some time in the cycle, it might be well below 1%. At some times, it might be above 2%. Above 2%. So, you know, it's disingenuous for a banker, for example, to say margins are really low on home loans at the moment without looking at the other side of the balance sheet because margins are really high on deposits. Unfortunately, right now, we're actually having that behaviour where, where we've got some banks sort of setting rates with only reference, it would seem to me, to the wholesale rates. It's a sort of a bit of another story. But, uh, yeah, key point, the margins move in and out, but you've got to look at the total. And that's what I think the Commerce Commission will be looking at, you know, that quantum of the whole pricing decision, not just a pricing decision on an individual product in isolation. Mm -hmm. So when you, you look at bank margins at the moment, I mean, net interest margins, New Zealand banks typically do pretty well on net, you know, overall. <laughs> um, but net interest margins are, by international comparisons, are usually pretty strong here. How, how do they measure up at the moment and are they justifiable overall? Well, the short answer is I believe, no, they're not justifiable. Um, there's a fantastic series that the Reserve Bank's got that you can get off their website, which runs for 32 years, so back to 1991. And in that you can see the interest margin and other income for banks over that time. Now, what was interesting going back to um, 20 years is that banks used to get 40% of their income from fees other income fees. And so that was, remember, remember the days you had 40 cents a transaction yep. and $10 sort of for the month and, you know, or maybe you had $10 plus some fees and so on. Today you're paying next to nothing. And so there's been this massive erosion of fees and that's been driven by digital banking because you don't have to go into a branch and have a teller accept your deposits or withdrawals and so on. So technology has driven out fees and competition has driven out fees. Probably Kiwi Bank's um, arrival 21 years ago contributed to that because they were the low fee bank back then. Now most banks don't have fees. So the interest margin going back to 1991 was more like 3.5%. And if you look at the graph over that 32 years, that interest margin has steadily declined. It will go up and down at different periods, but it's steadily declined from about 3.5% to 2% before COVID hit. Today it's 2.4%. So that long down, down, downtrend driven by the interest rate reductions and then increase in the OCR subsequent as the Reserve Bank tightened policy has allowed banks to expand interest margins by what works out at about 20%. So it's a, it's a, it's a lift in the price, that the net margin you're charging on your product of 20%, which actually most New Zealand businesses would love if they could do that as an industry. And that's an oligopoly in action, and that's what the Commerce Commission will be exploring. Mm, that's interesting. So one of the other things that I think people ask about quite a bit with home loans is, you know, you mentioned in New Zealand that most of us are on one, two-year mm. fixed-term loans. Obviously, you can go as far out as five years if you really want to. I think for mm. a short period of time, BNZ had a seven-year, but yeah. it didn't get a lot of take, and maybe mm. TSB as well, but mm. didn't get a lot of take-up. Then you look elsewhere, like, mm. for example, if you look at Australia, most people there are on variable or floating 
mm. mortgage rates. And then you look to the US and they have these 30-year mm. fixed-term mortgage rates. Mm. So why are these differences between these three markets? Yeah. Well, perhaps starting with what's logical, the logical thing is for everyone to have a floating interest rate. Maybe if you want interest rate certainty, you'd have a fixed interest rate. Why it's different in New Zealand is partly my fault, (laughs) going right back to the 90s. Now, back then, everyone in New Zealand did have a floating interest rate. And I was at Trust Bank at the time, um, and we and other banks started to use a fixed rate special. So we'd go, you can get a special rate for one year, for example, and we'd take a lower margin because it was just that little bit of new money coming into the system we kept. You know, So we'd do a special rate at a lower margin than on the floating rate. Now, what happened was over 20 years, everything became a special fixed rate, and that was the only rate most people took. And so what you saw is intense competition for fixed rates. In theory, it starts out, it's just the mar- the next new loan that's done. You know, it's the marginal cost. But when the whole portfolio becomes fixed rate, it becomes the price on the portfolio. But because all the competition was there, banks just kept on fattening and fattening and fattening margins on floating rates to the point where today they're sitting at about more than 3% above the wholesale, the OCR, whereas fixed rates are typically in a range of 1% to 1.5%. So, you know, you be the judge of whether that's fair or not, um, but that's the sort of history. It was basically pricing, competitive pricing to win new business, which simply became the norm in the market. So today it's a much lower interest rate because the margin's lower on fixed rates. Turn to Australia, a lot more competition. And so competition has kept those floating margins at similar levels to fixed margins. And generally the yield curve is upward sloping. In other words, short-term rates are lower than long-term rates. And so it makes sense the cheapest point on the yield curve is the short rates. So almost everyone's got floating. Now there are times when competition will come into the market and those fixed rates might go down. So Australia has had a bit of a trend towards fixed rates a couple of years ago, especially when interest rates rates were really low. You know, around, you know, you could get a 2% interest rate in Australia. Now everything's turning back to floating. So that's sort of and that's because interest margins are the same on fixed and floating rates in Australia. US is a totally different story. Um, it's an incredibly liquid market. You've got government bonds and so on being issued for 30, 40. I think I've even seen a 100-year bond. So a fixed interest yeah. rate for the next 100 years. Yeah, <laughs> it's I've crazy seen those to, too. It's, crazy to think yeah. about. But it's a very liquid market. And the other thing about the US market is banks generally don't own mortgages. They sell them, they originate them, take a margin, and then they sell it off to wholesale investors through things like securitization, mortgage-backed securities. You know, arguably the cause of the global financial crisis was mortgage-backed securities, but banks don't hold it on their balance sheet. So they sell it off to an investor that is either speculating or holding for the long term because they're a pension fund or something like that. And so they're prepared to accept really long-term interest rates. And the the, the really unusual thing about that market is you can take a 30-year fixed rate and then you can give it back to the bank, pay it back with no penalty at all. And so so, so it's a, sort of a weird market. So as interest rates fall, there's this huge amount of people switching, you know, paying it off and getting a new one lower and lower. And then when interest rates are really low, they're not going to pay it off. So it's just a really liquid market with a different way of operation with most assets, most home loans being securitized into the wholesale markets where the investors are very different risk profiles from the banks. Okay. And there's obviously a whole range of other retail uh, products that have interest rates attached to them. And I'm, I'm talking here about loans. So I'd just be interested to get a little bit of flavor on how these are set. So things like personal loans. So these might be taken out for debt consolidation, mm. home renovations, big purchases, emergency expenses, holidays, mm. whatever takes people's fancy. Um, car loans, an obvious one. And good old credit cards, which still seem to have very high interest rates, in, in my opinion. Mm. So, I mean, how do banks come up with these interest rates? Yeah. Well, on those products, generally, there's a different credit risk profile. And what I mean by that is that if there's a home loan, for a start, the, gov- the, the bank takes a registered first mortgage. So if everything turns to custard, they can sell your property and get most of their money back. And that's where the loan-to-value ratios come in, because if I've only lent you 80% of the value of a home, 
then you get into problems. Chances are I'll get my money back. So the historical loss rate on home loans runs at something ridiculously low, like one basis point over the last 20 or 30 years. So in other words, banks don't generally lose money on home loans because there's such good security. And also we live in the house, so it's going to be the place we, the thing that we pay for first when our pay packet comes in. So really low credit risk. Turn to a credit card, the credit risk is much higher and people default on those. You know, they don't lose their house when they default on those. And so loss rates on credit cards, they, they vary through the economic cycle. So when unemployment's high, they tend to go up. Um, but generally, you'd look at it's sort of a 2 to 4% loss rate. So if you sort of think about the interest margins got to cover that, so therefore the interest rate's got to be got to be high to take account of that. And personal loans are sort of similar loss rates on, you know, def- um, Delinquency rates on home loans are running at uh, personal loans are running at about eight percent at the moment, I think, and so you know the loss rate might end up being about four percent. So you've got to sort of have your interest rate cover that as well as the cost of borrowing the money. But then banks are taking a pretty decent margin, as you mentioned, the credit card interest rate. It's been unchanged pretty much for the last twenty years, even though interest rates have gone from ten to zero and back to, you know, six. That, that uh, credit card interest rate average for people paying interest is about 18% and it hasn't changed in all that time. So what that means is, you know, a lot of people obviously have don't pay interest on their credit cards, so they run it up, pay the balance off and so on. So the average interest rate on credit cards is about 11%, take off credit losses of, let's say, three, that leaves eight, you're funding it at six, five and a half, six percent you're making a 2% um, margin. Of course, when interest rates were really low, the margin was was bigger. But, you know, the secret is not to have credit card debt. It's terrible. It's a terrible deal. And anyone with interest-bearing debt on a credit card should go to their bank and at least move it to a personal loan to to pay it off. Uh, Credit cards are fantastic instruments for payments, but a terrible instrument for borrowing money. Personal loans are sort of somewhere between the two. You know, arguably the margins are there, there are a bit too high. But, you know, it's competition in those two products that would that would drive those interest rates down. And other areas that are, you know, obviously key areas of, of borrowing in New Zealand, business and rural, mm. um, rural or agricultural lending, mm. there's less sort of, I guess, information mm. visible yep. around how banks price these rates. Mm. And obviously with business loans, you get loans for small businesses and mm. then loans for big corporates, which can be really different as well. Mm. So what are the key factors that make up how banks price these loans? Yeah, well, starting with the easiest end is the big corporate stuff. So they will have in their loan agreement with the bank a fixed margin over a wholesale interest rate. So depending on how high the credit quality is of that borrower. So if Ontario, for example, would borrow at a different rate from a small sort of company. And so, you know, if Ontario might be at a margin of sort of 0.75 0.75 or 1% over the wholesale interest rate, whereas a small business might be at a margin, you know, 2 or 3% depending on the credit risk. When you're into those sort of non-corporate space, you're into a similar approach to what happens with home lending, um, where banks will sort of have a benchmark rate that goes up and down as, as that OCR moves, as wholesale rates move. If it's a fixed rate, the swap rate will come into play. And then they'll add a, add a margin for the risk, but also to ensure they're earning an, an appropriate return in their eyes because you have to, as a bank, hold more capital for business loans than you do for home loans. And so in terms of return on capital, you've, um, you've, you've sort of got a bigger margin, partly reflecting that as well. But generally, it's a sort of a risk and return sort of thing, but with the same principles as, say, for home lending. And rural loans is done in the same way as yeah, business? Yeah, 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 very similar to business loans. I mean, if you're in the, in the, the as you say, they're not very trans. Not, not very transparent, you know, banks publish base rates, yeah. but you don't know what margin people are paying over On those top of base, the base rates. Rate, Normally yeah. everyone will be paying a margin over the base rate, so yep. you can't look at the base rate and say that's the rate borrowers are paying, whereas with home loans you can. But it's the same underlying principle. And, and you know, if you're in the agri sector, you know, there'll be advisors that can sort of tell you what all the different banks are charging. It's just not as transparent as, as with the retail market. So you, you talked about with home loans, with obviously the, 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 the lender has the security of the, the house. Yeah. I guess I just wanted to touch on secured and unsecured lending mm. because obviously mm. some personal lending might be secured if mm. I take mm. out a loan to buy a car. It might be secured against the car mm. or it might not be. Mm. So that obviously will, yeah. will affect the risk profile that's for right. the lender and how much I pay on my, on my loan. Yeah, that's right. So a secured um, personal loan generally would be secured against a car. Uh, will be cheaper than an unsecured because the the lender can sell it 
the car. Now, often that doesn't mean you get the value that it's sort of, but, but it is more. There is more security there. So the loss rate, what the bank ultimately loses from bad debts on those car loans, will be that are secured, will be lower because there's a car that can be repossessed and sold. So you know the underlying risk is affected by the security. As I say, for home loans, there's very very low risk for unsecured personal loans, credit cards, much, much higher risk and business can be anywhere on the spectrum. You know, a very profitable business is relatively unrisky, a, a sort of less profitable or highly volatile profitability sort of business is, is more risky. And so the interest margin will reflect that. And just the other thing on this I wanted to touch on is, is bank capital. Now, we, mm. we don't want to turn this into a, a mm. podcast about bank capital. We, mm. We've done that separately. We can do it again another time. Yeah. But just in terms of I guess banks' regulatory capital requirements, how does that drive the sectors that they prefer to lend into? A lot. Uh, banks for home loans, vanilla home loans, hold a 35% risk weighting um, and, and would, compared to, say, a business loan, which would be 100% or a personal loan or credit card being 100%. So that almost means you get three times the bang for your buck <laughs> in terms of if you've got a buck of capital, a dollar of capital, then you can lend three times as much with that capital for a home loan as a business loan. Now, if you sort of think about the profit that you earn, you calculate how much money you make divided by how much capital you've got invested. And so, you know, if you can do three times as much, you can accept a lower margin. So capital has a big influence on um, interest rates because they drive return on equity. And ultimately, it's that return on equity that, that drives what a, what a company will be worth on the share market. So most of the banks in New Zealand are listed in the Australian market. Um, so the return on equity determines the share price. And so the pricing behaviour is ultimately in growth aspirations and outcomes will drive that share price. And so, you know, how much capital is invested and the return on equity in particular, mm -hmm. how that flows into dividends um, and influences um, the, the, the share price. So capital is a big influence. Um, yeah. Okay. The other area I was just interested in touching on is bonds. Mm -hmm. Now, there's obviously a whole range of different types of bonds and I mean, we don't have to go into all of them, but just to list mm. a few corporate bonds, obviously, inflation index bonds, mm. um, you know, green bonds now, um, government bonds, local government bonds. Obviously, there's there's fixed rate and floating rate bonds, and that's another story altogether. Good old junk bonds. Um, <laughs> so just, I guess, how are interest rates typically set on bonds? It's a risk thing. So uh, just like I was describing with business loans are generally more risky than home loans. Um Corporate bonds are more risky than government because the government can just tax us. The local authority can just charge us rates. So those are sort of lower on the risk profile. So generally the benchmarks are set by government, what the government's paying on bonds and what they've been traded at in the market. Local authorities will be a little bit of a margin above that, but pretty low because, you know, they can set our rates and we don't have a say in that. <laughs> as much as we'd like anyway. Um, and then you move into sort of corporate debt and it's it's a risk thing. So an Auckland airport will borrow at sort of a cheaper rate than probably a port of Auckland, for example. You know, so the margin's determined by the risk profile, the credit rating if they're a big entity. So essentially it's driven by risk. And I'm just really keen to, to sort of finish off just to have a look at, I guess, any specific risks or dangers that, that people should be wary of in a rising or a high interest rate mm. environment, and both for, for, for savers or investors and, and mm. borrowers. Mm. And I think from the savings perspective, I mean, we obviously had a falling interest rate or a low interest rate environment for, for a long time before COVID came along, mm. a decade or so. Mm. And I remember one of the, 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 the things that I covered through that period was a, a Rabobank perpetual resettable bond that was issued in 2007 and it was at the time it was the biggest New Zealand non-government debt issue ever. Nine hundred million dollars was raised or borrowed by Rabobank, and the initial interest rate was set in October two thousand and seven at nine point four eight two percent, which was a margin of seventy six basis points over the one year swap rate. The thing was, it was reset annually at the same margin for the next decade before Rabobank redeemed it. So by the time it was redeemed in, in twenty seventeen. That, that annual interest rate was down to 2.88%. So that was kind of a, here's a bit of a, a you know, a, a thing to be wary of in a falling interest rate environment. But what about in, in rising interest rate environments like now? Well, you know, the best uh, deal in town two years ago was to take a five-year fixed home loan rate at 2.99%. Now, the challenge always is that there was a better deal 
um, for a shorter term. So you could borrow for 2.25% for one year. So you're always making this trade-off. Should I take a long-term rate and lock it in, get the certainty? And at what point in the interest rate cycle are we? And Harry Hines, Harry Hindsight is the best trader, right? <laughs> you look back and you <laughs> yeah. go, why didn't we all take five-year fixed rates at 2.99? Of course we didn't. Um, so, um, you know, in a, in a low interest rate environment, you know, and it's a judgment thing, but when interest rates are really low, it makes sense to lock in for longer terms when interest rates are really high. And, you know, it's, we're in an interest rate cycle where the, inter- where the Reserve Bank's role is to control inflation. They've pushed the OCR up. The natural level of the OCR is several percent below where it is now. The Reserve Bank has published their view on that. Um, and so we are at the top of the cycle, interest rate rise or very near to it. And so locking in now for a long term probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But the longer term rates are lower than the one year, the five year rates are lower than the one year rate. So it's again that judgment, you know, do I take a lower long term rate or a higher short term rate? If interest rates fall, I'll benefit from a lower short term, um, higher short term rate and vice versa. So, you know, it's always a trade off. But I mean, the, my, my reflection is, as a borrower, it's often wise to spend spread your risk. So, you know, have a bit at one year, two year, three year, because interest rates might not fall for a year or two. You know, many forecasters have moved their expectation from, say, February out to, you know, a year later even. And so if you'd locked in for two years, um, you know, at sub 7%, that was probably a good deal in hindsight. So, you know, we can't, you know, predict what's going to happen in the future. But what we can say is we're almost certainly at, at or very near the top of the interest rate cycle. So it makes sense to have, sh- have lower short-term rates. And I guess that's why you go to a mortgage advisor who will give you know, advice on how to structure your mortgage. They'll take account of your personal circumstance. You know, Could you afford it if interest rates went up 1% or 2%? Um, have you got flexibility and so on? And, and you know, the best thing is always to pay a bit more on your mortgage so you build up a buffer. So if interest rates are really low, you've paid more off your mortgage. So if interest rates rise, there's a bit of a buffer. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's sort of a risk management and what's the risk risk. But, you know, what I'd say is when interest rates fall and you're in a long-term fixed rate, you'll have break fees. And that's because the bank has hedged that that interest rate for, say, five years or three years. And if you break out of that three- or five-year term that you've taken on your home loan, then they've got to unwind the other side of that transaction and they'll lose money on that. So they recover at that from you, which is sort of fair enough, but it's something to be wary of. You know, you could very easily be paying ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars of break fees on a long term fixed rate if interest rates fell two percent over the next two to three years, which is quite probable. That's interesting. And I guess on the saving side of the coin, you know, if, if you think interest rates are near mm-hmm. the, the peak then maybe fixing on a savings product for mm. a medium to longer term might not be a bad idea. Yeah, at the well, that's you're absolutely right. But the problem is that New Zealanders have almost all their term deposits in one year or, or shorter terms. And I guess the reason for that is because that money's locked away for that term. You've legally made a contract with the bank to leave that money with them for two or three or five years. And most banks do offer five year, up to five year term deposit rates. But almost all the money sits at one year, and I guess it's that flexibility. I want to know I can get my money out. The better solution, really, if you sort of think rates are high and you want to lock those rates in and have that security, generally it's older people with a lot of money invested. So if you want that security of a regular income stream, you're better off to avoid bank deposits and go into a, you know, maybe a managed fund or don't invest directly, say, in government stock or a long-term corporate fixed-rate bond where you can sell it on the secondary market so you can you can unlock that um, that money as opposed to it being locked away at a bank. Very few New Zealanders do that. You you really have to go through a share broker or, you know, a trading share trading platform to have access to that. Um, but you know it's a really good alternative um, for when interest rates are high in particular because you can get your money out. There's always going to be a buyer of government stock at, at, at the going market price. Well, look, um, David, thanks a lot for that. It's a, it's a great chat about uh, interest rates. That is David Cunningham, who is the CEO of financial services firm Squirrel Group. And I'm Gareth Vaughan at interest.co.nz with another episode of our Of Interest podcast. 